Howdy. Um, wine has been grown in the Bordeaux region of France ever since the Romans planted the first vineyards there almost 2,000 years ago. Today, Bordeaux is famous for its red wine and it's the source of some of the most expensive wine in the world. Yet the price of that wine and its quality varies considerably from year to year. So each year, the question is asked, just how good is this vintage? Will it be a classic, perhaps like the great 1961? Or more, might it be more like the disappointing 1960? To answer that question, each year, about four months after the wine is barreled, the wine experts will take their first taste. That early in the young wine's life, it tastes like swill. It's over a year away from being bottled, and it's many years from its prime. But from that first taste, the wine experts will try the difficult task of determining just how good that wine will be when it reaches its prime at maturity. The wineries hang on those expert pronouncements. They appear in wine guides and they drive early demand. They affect the prices of the early wine sales. The economist Orly Ashenfelter came up with an alternative to expert judgment to predict the wine price and quality. He used a simple statistical formula for what you might call an algorithm. Ashenfelter's algorithm had three inputs. It was the previous summer's growing season temperature, the previous winter's rainfall, and the harvest rainfall. Using his algorithm, Ashenfelter produced a prediction that he circulated in a newsletter to a small circle of wine lovers. So you can see in this story two contrasting ways of informing or making a decision. In the first case, we have expert or human judgment. In the second case, we have an algorithm. Which should we use? We use experts for many of our most important decisions. We visit doctors when we're sick. We consult stockbrokers and financial advisors. Uh, we read reviews by wine experts. We tend to use algorithms less often. Consulting an expert seems to be something that's sensible. After all, they, they typically have a, a lot of experience in training. A doctor might have over a decade of um, generalist training, then specialist training. They might have seen thousands of patients with problems just like yours. A wine expert might have uh, tasted tens of thousands of wines. Algorithms, we use them less often, but you do see them in some places in business. An algorithm might determine what ads you see when you're browsing online. A bank might use an algorithm to determine whether to give you a loan. But there are some places we simply don't see algorithms. It's rare to go into a doctor's office and see them take your symptoms, enter those symptoms into an algorithm to produce uh, a diagnosis and your treatment plan. Given this, which should we use? Um, now, we actually run into a bit of a problem here because generally what happens is an algorithm is typically a better, resp a better response than human judgment. Let's return to all the Ashenfelter in the winery. Ashenfelter found that when he used his algorithm to predict the price and quality of the wine, he could predict more of the variation than the expert judgment. He could take the expert judgment and he could add his weather information to it and produce a better prediction. And the beauty of Ashenfelter's method was he could make his prediction without even tasting the wine. So he could make his prediction several months in advance. Now this story isn't just an isolated story that I have plucked out of the air. This is a typical result of when you compare human judgment and the performance of an algorithm. So this has been found in medical and psychiatric diagnosis, in university admissions, in recruitment decisions, in parole decisions, in geopolitical forecasting, just to name a few areas. To give an illustration, in one study, William Grove and colleagues looked at 126, actually 136 studies in medical and psychiatric diagnosis where an algorithm and a human were compared in their ability to make a decision. In 63 of those studies, the algorithm was a superior option. In 65, we had a tie. That leaves eight out of 136 studies in which the human was the better option. So here now you start to see our problem. When people have a choice between their own judgment and a superior algorithm, they tend to choose their own judgment. There are many theories as to why this is the case. One of the simplest is simply that we believe our ability is better than it actually is. 
Another reflects a desire to maintain a human element to decision making. But to me, one of the more interesting relates to the types of mistakes that an algorithm will make. So algorithms are not perfect. They do make mistakes. But because they're not human, the types of mistakes that an algorithm will make will tend to be different to those that a human will make. And to a human, those algorithm mistakes will quite often look pretty stupid. So to give you an example, when IBM Watson won the game show Jeopardy, uh, it defeated the two greatest human players of all, of all time. So IBM Watson is a pretty strong player. But when it was, had to answer a question as to which, US, which city um, had its largest airport named after a World War II hero, um, it gave a, an apparently stupid answer. The, the category for the question was US cities, and IBM Watson answered, what is Toronto? Now, this um, difference in, in um, type of mistake that algorithms make and the possibility that they make what seems to be a human, stupid mistakes, could be one reason why people don't like to use algorithms. Um, Berkeley, Dietvorst and colleagues looked at this in the lab. They found that when, that when someone had seen an algorithm perform and seen, it, seen its errors, they were less likely to use it for the task than someone who hadn't seen it perform. This is despite the fact that when they saw it perform, they also saw that that algorithm was better at the task than they were. They focused far more on the algorithm's errors, the algorithm's apparently stupid errors, than they did on their far more common errors that they made themselves. Now, apart from being a reason why, uh, why, hum why humans don't like to use algorithms, this difference in the type of error also points to an interesting possibility as to how we can get better decisions. Uh, this possibility was explored by one of my intellectual heroes, the experimental psychologist Paul Meal, who back in 1954 proposed a thought experiment that's now known as the broken leg problem. Imagine you are trying to predict whether someone will go to the movies on a Friday night. You produce an algorithm to develop this prediction, and the algorithm gives a 90% probability that they'll attend the movie. Now, you discover just, just before um, the Friday night that this person has broken their leg. They're in an immobilization cast. So the actual probability of them going to the movie is close to zero. But if you stick to your algorithm's prediction, you're almost certainly going to fail in your prediction task. So what do you do? You place your algorithm in the hands of a human. The human brain is acutely sensitive to the unusual, to the types of problems that can derail an algorithm. Um, when there's a broken leg, the human can intervene. Um, now, some people um, see this as a, as a way of, of the future, that, that the better option here is actually a human algorithm combination. But let's explore this in a little bit more detail. And to do that, we're going to go into the world of freestyle chess. Um, so chess, in chess, computers have been at the top of the pile since 1997, where world champion Gary Kasparov um, de was defeated by IBM Deep Blue. Um, now, despite that that um, that lead, it's only well, despite that defeat. Then the the gap's only grown. So, chess players are rated in what's known as the LO rating system. Uh, the threshold for a grandmaster is about two thousand an LO rating of two thousand five hundred. Uh, the highest LO rating ever achieved by a human is two thousand nine hundred, well, almost two thousand nine hundred by world champion Magnus Carlsen. Today's best chess software has an LO rating of around three thousand five hundred. So for a human, that top chess software is near on untouchable. But there is this style of chess called freestyle chess. In freestyle chess, anything goes. So you can call a friend, you can consult the I Ching, or you can use a computer. The typical pattern of play in freestyle chess involves a team of players consulting across multiple computers with different software on them in real time. They might put the position of the board across all these machines, and if they differ in one of the machines, put that different recommendation into the other. They're effectively looking for weaknesses in the software that they can exploit. Now, the evidence from freestyle chess tournaments to date is that the best freestyle chess players are not computers alone. It's not the best software alone. It's these human-computer combinations. So some people see this as the prototype of the future of human decision making. So the best decision maker is not man, it's not an algorithm, it is a combination of the two. 
But I don't want to leave this freestyle chess story just yet, because I believe this story is incomplete. And the um, interpretation of this, this story is, um, has, has some limitations. So first up, the gap now between the best freestyle chess players and the best software alone is closing, if not closed. The, uh, <coughs> this reflects a, 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 what you might call a natural evolution of human-machine relationships. So initially, a machine is a, it's just a novelty. It then becomes something that does provide some use to the humans, but needs a lot of human help. It then becomes something that you know, is, is, is highly useful. In fact, it's almost vital to the human, but it still needs a lot of human guidance before ultimately it becomes a machine that we should leave alone. But the more important reason why I think that we should um, be somewhat wary of this picture of the future is, has to do with the scalability of this solution. And to do that, to, to illustrate this, I want to um, ask you a question. So imagine that each of you are going to play in a freestyle chess tournament. Um, for your um, teammate, I'm going to give you IBM Deep Blue. So our world, cha our world champion defeating chess computer from 1997. It's a pretty strong player, but it's um, vastly inferior to today's best chess software. Still, it did beat the best um, chess player, one of the best chess players of all time. Now, I want you to think, what can you personally bring to this team with Deep Blue? For most of us, we're best off knowing our limits and leaving those chess pieces alone. And this warning doesn't apply just because we might be novice chess players. It even applies to grandmasters. There are some great failures by grandmasters in freestyle chess. Their belief in their own ability leads them to interfere with the, the, their superior machine too often. The best freestyle chess players will only overrule their machine a handful of times each game. So what happens when we go beyond the world of, of chess and start thinking about this combination more generally of humans and algorithms? Although it's definitely underexplored, the pattern of play by these grandmasters is typical of what we see when a human is combined with an algorithm. We overrule and intervene too often. We see broken legs everywhere. Give an algorithm to a human and you'll tend to improve that human's performance. But the better decision maker is typically that algorithm by itself. This isn't to say that we can't try and create effective teams. The, the, the success of freestyle chess teams to date points to that possibility. But can this be done at scale? Can it be done so that this um, advantage persists over the long term? And is this skill to effectively pair with an algorithm an ability that's held by a rare, humble few? If we can't come up with effective ways to team humans and algorithms, the pattern we will see, or what we should see, is algorithms replacing humans decision by decision. Um, the future won't be one, one of us working together. And in fact, what will be left is quite a few, few decisions for those humans, thankfully, that we still have to make ourselves. So let me paint a picture of the future. Um, one in which humans do play an important role. And in fact, every feature I can conceive of, humans do play a vital part. It's just not the part which, which you might think. So picture a system where an algorithm, once developed, is deployed and left alone. Um, it, we deploy these algorithms in banks, in doctor's surgeries, in hospitals, in courts, um, making some pretty important decisions. But we, each time they make a decision, that decision is untouched by a human. Now, this doesn't mean we fire the human decision makers. So a doctor, for instance, will still have many important decisions that they'll need to make. Um, the algorithms can't do everything yet. But every time that doctor comes to a decision in which the algorithm has been demonstrated to be the better decision maker, the doctor should hand over that decision and let the algorithm decide. So these algorithms will make mistakes. They will uh, miss broken legs. But the human will be kept out of the loop. Why? Because they step in too often and the human mistakes overwhelm the machine errors that they fix. Instead, we have a different involvement by humans. Humans are managers of an algorithm workforce. So these man human managers don't interfere with individual decisions. Instead, what they do is they look across many decisions by an algorithm over time. Then, they provide feedback to the algorithm by tweaking it to make it better. 
So in the case of our doctor's surgery, the doctor is not the manager of the algorithm. The, doc the algorithm manager might have algorithms deployed across thousands of doctor's surgeries or hospitals. That will then allow them to see tens of thousands of decisions every day. So this is good decision making and feedback at scale. Is this the future? I don't know. But the evidence to date suggests that human algorithm combinations don't always work. Yes, when you look at the le level of the system, humans will be vital. But when it comes to individual decisions, quite often that best decision will come when we exclude human judgment and leave the algorithm alone. Thank you.